Welcome to our service this morning here at the Rimby Alliance Church. We welcome each of you that are here in attendance with us this morning, and we welcome those who are joining us online from home or from wherever they may be. It is our pleasure to have you join with us. Last week, we finished off our One Anothering series. I'm going to say this. From my perspective, it's, it's comforting to do a series. And the reason is I always know where I'm going. I don't get, well, what, Lord, do you want me to preach on this week? But as we finished off last week, and we were talking about how fellowship is the result of one anothering, we, we looked at some scriptures that, that spoke to me, and I felt like coming from that series of messages, it would be a good time to, can I say it this way, go back to basics. We read a passage from John chapter 3 last week, and we're going to look at that same passage this morning. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I offer my apologies. We are going to read from John chapter 3, but we're going to go all the way from verse 1 through 21. So a long passage, but it draws it into context. It really allows us to see what Jesus is speaking there in John chapter 3. And I think next week, next week we will go for a walk down the Romans road. And if I say it that, that way, how many of you recognize what the Romans road is really about? It is a way that, that, that God has worked out our salvation for us. It's a convenient way, if I can say it this way, of, of witnessing to someone how we can simply take passages within the book of Romans and show you have a need for salvation and here's how you come to that saving relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we will look at that next week. This morning we are looking at our need for salvation. I have... I'll say it this way, in some of the readings that I have done, and even fairly recently, there are many in society who look at organized religion with a wrong point of view on why we gather together to worship and praise our God. And their view of who God is, they, they see God as this awful menace to all that they hold dear, trying to suppress their will with demands that are not attainable. And that's wrong, isn't it? That is wrong from a biblical perspective. That is not who our God is. And it is not what Jesus Christ came to earth to accomplish. So to make statements like that is to entirely ignore the biblical account of Christ's life and his work. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. I don't think there's anyone here this morning who will argue or debate this with me, but allow me to walk us through this process, looking at these in context. John chapter 3, reading verses 1 through 21. John 3, 1 through 21. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I had told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven." And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but of everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the one only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Let's pray. Lord God, as we come before you this morning and we look for the truth in your word, we see here a passage where, where Lord, you have given us your truth. May that truth ring loudly in our lives. Lord, may we not only believe what you have written, but may we show it in all that we do, that your truth goes forth. And Lord, may it speak to us this morning as we examine this unique relationship that we have with you and recognize that, Lord, We do, each of us, need your salvation. As we pray in your most holy name, amen. In this passage that we've just read, there's a couple of things that we need to glean. First, Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a a member of the religious ruling party at that time. He's uh, accounted here as being a Pharisee. He came to see Jesus covertly. He did not want to be seen in this process of coming to see Jesus. Even though the Romans were occupying the land, they allowed the the Jewish people to maintain their religious system. So the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees were all still in place and were responsible to govern the moral and religious affairs of God's chosen people. However, the Romans did not allow them to govern their civil affairs. For that, Roman rule had been established and there was a strong Roman presence to enforce it. But but Nicodemus, who was a trained man as a Pharisee, he was educated, he was a a scholar of the law, recognized from Jesus' teaching that something was different, something needed to be done, that religious rites and and, and practices were not sufficient to achieve what Jesus was teaching. Knowing Jesus, Nicodemus snuck to him in the night. And and, and in this conversation that we see that is recorded here, Jesus states to Nicodemus, you must be born again. It is not enough just to be born of this earth if we want to see the kingdom of God. There There is more that is required. And we all know you cannot earn your way into heaven. We cannot buy our way into heaven and that we do not deserve the right for the mansion that's been prepared for us. But the kingdom of God is still a home that we may achieve. Amen? And so Jesus goes on to explain to Nicodemus that he, Jesus, will be put on the cross. That whosoever believes on him will have eternal life. It is not restricted just to the Jewish people or their converts. God, out of his love for all people, sent Jesus into the world, not to condemn the world for their actions and beliefs and sins, but to save them, to reconcile them, to restore them to fullness of relationship with God the Father. That we, Nicodemus then and us today, may walk in the light as he is in the light, and by that God shall be revealed. It's a wonderful account. But in reading through there, sometimes what we miss is this. Some fear the threat of condemnation. The the word is used four times in this passage. Uh, Amongst other beautiful words like love, eternal life, everlasting life, saved, light. This morning, we're going to look specifically at verse 18. I'll read verses 17 and 18 together. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world that, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, 
because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. There are many who believe right now today that how we behave and act on earth determines our eternal outcome. And at the end, we are judged on how we act and how we behave by a mighty and malicious God serving in the role of judge. And that's wrong. I want to point out this morning it is exactly the opposite. The important choices we make in life are not how we're going to act and behave because they won't have any impact on our eternal outcome. The one choice we have an opportunity to make is this. We believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And that is the only begotten Son. He was sent to the cross to die on our behalf. And that his death and resurrection have brought us life. That we may be saved, restored into the relationship that God originally created us for. And the difference is this in the middle part of verse 18. The statement that's made by Jesus to Nicodemus is this. He that believeth not is condemned already. Jesus has not come to condemn. It is our natural state. We are born in a state of condemnation. But Jesus came to offer a way that is to radically impact how we live to circumvent our natural state so that we may have eternal life. In glory, in heaven, in a mansion that has been prepared for us. Jesus wants to restore us to the fellowship that man was originally created for. Again, there are many who see God as a magistrate, as a judge. And he sits at a desk with a, a set of scales. And that as people come before him, God weighs out the good and the bad. And they hope that their good works outweigh their bad works and that the scale tips in their favor and God shows leniency. Uh, just perhaps, perhaps they might be allowed into heaven. And I'm here to say this morning, the scale does not move. That if you do not know God and go before him, there, there, there's no adjustment. That scale is tipped. You are condemned already. Those are the words that we have read this morning. If you do not believe in who Jesus is and you go before God, the scale is tipped. You are condemned already. What did King David write? If we look just quickly, Psalm 51, verse 5. King David wrote, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. David was not speaking against his mother or his father. He was not blaming the world for his condition. He was simply recognizing that his and our human nature is corrupt. In reality, he was not at fault, but he was still affected. We are all born into sin. It is the nature, our nature, at birth. We are, as Jesus stated to Nicodemus and John has recorded, we are condemned already because of that sinful nature. Jesus did not come to condemn. He came to save, rescue, and restore us. Condemnation was already in place. To understand this aspect of restoration, we have to go right back to the very beginning. And we don't have the time necessary now to read all through this. I would encourage you this week, read the first three or four chapters of Genesis and just see how all of this unfolds. Genesis chapter 1 is the creation account. And we read at the end of it, And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. How many of us believe God created everything? Amen? And yet we know there are other theories that exist that it just baffles me. One of those is the Big Bang Theory, chaos theory, that out of something destructive, something beautiful and improved comes. Let me relate it to this as I've been doing some thinking on this. It's like saying, if I took a, I uh, have to think of the years they made them in, what might it be, a 78 AMC Gremlin. I don't know if they made AMC Gremlins in 78, but how many of you are familiar with the old AMC Gremlins? It would be like taking an AMC Gremlin and driving it into a light pole and expecting it to turn into a Porsche. No, no that is what they're saying. This is chaos theory. 
That out of this explosion, there's something beautiful that came out of that. We know that that's not the case. Or we would all be buying old cars. Let, let me say, say this. I can't remember. I've lost track. But I had any uh, enjoyable youth. I think I was the veteran of 12 or 13 accidents that God saw me through. Uh, we have tried to take Olds 98s flying. And Olds, Oldsmobile 98s do not fly very well. Um, and as it sat there crumpled in the ditch, let me assure you, it did not turn into a Porsche or a Mercedes-Benz. Even Barb, my loving wife, who started off with a, was it a, a 69? 65 Chevy Nova. Now, Barb in her younger days used to be a gymnast, and so she decided to try it with her car. She did cartwheels in her Nova. It did not turn into a BMW or anything else. Why? Because that is not how nature reacts. It is like uh, we, we see where they blow up buildings to knock them down to build something new. If the chaos theory were true, some of those buildings would turn into the Taj Mahal. And, and that is literally what, what, what they say, what they expect would happen. That in that destruction, something beautiful would come out of it. I don't know of any single example. The other aspect is the, the, the whole primordial ooze, that, that out of this poisonous cauldron, life is going to emerge. That is the thing that horror movies are made of, not how we began. My friends, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and the evening and morning were the sixth day. And, and as we go into Genesis chapter 2, we see more detail how Adam and Eve were brought together, their roles, their purpose. But it also shows in chapter 2 of Genesis that God had a personal relationship with Adam and Eve. He walked in the garden with them. He was physically present. He communed. He fellowshiped with Adam and Eve. And then in Genesis chapter 3, we see disobedience and sin enter into the relationship that God had established. Genesis chapter 3 verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. My friends, this was God's intent. This is why he had created man. He walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. It's a relationship that he desires with each of us. Openness, honesty, communion, respect, love, in fellowship. This is what God wanted. But sin destroyed that relationship. And, and so at the end of the chapter, we see punishment coming. Barb and I were in the car just recently. We were driving, and I said to her, why is it that all the food we're not supposed to eat is really what we want? But, but, but that's, that's part of our nature is we see these things that, that appeal to us that we want, and yet these are the things we're told not to do. Adam and Eve had everything in that garden. They walked with God. The one thing they weren't supposed to do was the one thing that destroyed that relationship. Did Satan tempt them? Absolutely. Did Satan create the desire? I'm going to have to do more study because I started thinking about that this week. Where did that originally desire come from, or was that a product of freedom of choice? But we know what happened, the bottom line. Both Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and sin entered into this world and the relationship that we have with our Creator. At home, we have two cats. Their names are Pumpkin and Spice. They have an entire house to run around in, and over a period of time that we have had them, we have bought them a number of toys, which we thought should be appropriate for them. Our grandson didn't because the last time they were out, he stole them. Um, we have some new ones. But, but the reality is this. The, the, these two cats, for some reason, are determined to destroy our furniture. We are not sure why this is. Um, we've tried multiple ways to get beyond that. We have provided them with proper and appropriate ways to, to release their desires. We have a number of scratching posts in the house. We have a cat tree in the house for them to, to carry all of this out on. And yet they continue to scratch the furniture. Now we could say the fault is not pumpkin and spice. 
but is a former cat we had in the house, which was one of Courtney's, who, who did scratch up the furniture. But prior to that, when we received the furniture, and I have to be careful how I say this, because when we, when we hear hand-me-down, we tend to think of hand-me-downs with a negative connotation. We got that furniture from my parents when they updated their furniture. Um, an animal had never been on that furniture, and yet that cat, when that furniture came in the house, decided that it was the ideal place to scratch. What brought that on? So I could blame this on Courtney, but I have to say regardless, Pumpkin and Spice have chosen of their own initiative to scratch the furniture. Why? It's their nature. It is what they do. Cats scratch. And, and, and we have even gone to the point where we have bought catnip spray. And we've used catnip spray on, on all of the scratching posts and on the cat tree to encourage them to direct their activities there. That wasn't successful. We bought some other spray that is just horrible stuff that we have sprayed on the furniture to encourage them not to scratch the furniture and it may for a day or two and then they are back at it again. A cat will scratch because it is their nature. My friends, we are born into sin. We have a sinful nature. That is how we respond because it is who we are. At the end of chapter 3 of Genesis, we see the penalty for sin had been established, and then we see the outcome. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth, and this is speaking of Adam, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Fellowship was broken. And this is where we start our earthly journey from. A, a broken relationship, a loss of, of fellowship, a sinful nature, which is why it says in John 3.18, we are condemned already. Because that is who we are by birth. But my friends, God desires to be with us. God desires a relationship with each and every person. It, it is a picture of the garden. That God wants to walk with each of us in our daily walk. What a beautiful picture it paints, amen? What a beautiful picture. But <clears throat> because of man's choice, God can no longer do that. Instead, he sent his son into this world to save us, to restore the fellowship that we were originally created for. And it begins, the Christian walk begins simply with believing. John 3.18, he that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth. This, this word in the Greek that's used is the Greek word krino, which means to, to separate, to put asunder to determine, decree, to judge, sort of one of the lengthier definitions of it is this. Summoned to trial that one's case may be examined and judgment passed upon it. The Greek word is used 114 times in the New Testament. Uh, it's used as judge 88 times, determine seven times, condemn five times. And we see those uses here in the book of John. But to take this definition into understanding, John 3.18 could easily read, He that believeth on him is not examined for judgment, but he that believeth not is already examined, and judgment has been passed. That is the way that we come into this world. In that context, something else that is important to note, and I, I quote this morning the Cambridge Bible for schools and colleges. The statement that they make in the Cambridge Bible is this. The change of tense from present to perfect must be preserved. Unbelievers have no need to be sentenced by the Messiah. Their unbelief is of itself their sentence. And so, so what they're saying as they talk about this present and perfect tense is this. Now, I take this explanation from Robertson's word pictures. And they say that this. He that believed on, or he that believeth on him is not condemned. The believeth on him is, as they say in the Greek, and pardon me for getting Greek again, present passive indicative, if you want to write that down. So, he that believeth, <coughs> present passive indicative, 
And what that means is it's what's currently active. Present, passive indicative. What is currently active. So he that believeth, condition, present, and active, currently, is not condemned. He that believeth not. And this is where, as both uh, Cambridge Bible and Robertson's point out, perfect passive indicative. And perfect, pass, pass, perfect passive indicative is an indication this is the way that it is. This is the natural condition. This, this is how you find it all the time. Everybody, everywhere. Perfect passive indicative. He that believeth not is condemned already. It has already been established. It has already been passed. It is the state that we exist in unless it is altered. And how is it altered? Again, to go back by the present passive indicative, he that believeth. So, if you don't make that, if you don't alter the change of your state by believing, present pa passive indicative, you currently believe, then you exist in the state, perfect passive indicative, which is, you've already been established, you are condemned already. This is our natural state when, the, when we come into this world. How many of us know good people who are not saved, amen? Many of us. I, I know a number of people who are, who are wonderful people, who are good people, who are moral and upright and upstanding, but they are not Christians. And it does not matter how good they are. There is no balance to be performed at the end of days. They have already been judged and condemned because they do not believe in the work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To help put that into perspective, there's an account in Acts. Paul and Silas, as, as the background, have been thrown into prison for their ministry. Acts chapter 16, verses 25 through 33, we hear what happens after Paul and Silas have been thrown into prison and shackled. In Acts 16, 25 to 33, read this way. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. What must I do to be saved? Believe. Believe. For this morning, I'm simply trying to point out the keeper of the prison recognized a need for salvation. That it would bring about a change to his life. King David recognized the natural state that he was in was not sufficient for his salvation. And as we read through the chapter of chapter 51, we come across some very familiar verses. Here was King David's prayer. So he said in verse 5, I am born in sin. Here's his prayer, verses 10 through 12. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. You see, David recognized that in his natural state, he was not sufficient for salvation. And he went to his Lord God and he said, Create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit, so that I am not cast from your presence. David knew what had happened in the Garden of Eden. That when sin destroyed the relationship that man had with God, they were cast away from his presence. That relationship no longer exists unless the joy of salvation is present because we believe. I love David's word, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. That was his desire, 
today as we come before him, do we believe, do we know, do we understand the joy that salvation brings? King David did not want separation. His desire was to be restored unto. I hope, I'm going to say that line again because I'm not sure I said it correctly. King David did not want separation. King David desired to be restored unto salvation. And that is the way it is for each and every person. If we go back to Nicodemus, what did Jesus himself tell Nicodemus? Ye must be born again. My friends, there is a need for salvation. It does not come naturally. We cannot do anything about it. We cannot buy it. We cannot earn it. There's nothing we can do, but it starts with believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as our salvation. Each of us born to this world begins in a state of separation, condemned already because of our sinful nature. Jesus did not have to come to condemn because it already existed. Jesus came to save, to restore the relationship and fellowship that we had originally been created for. So much that could, should be said in light of this, and some of that we will look at next week as we explore the Romans road. In conclusion this morning, C.S. Lewis made this statement. There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, Thy will be done, and those to whom God says, Thy will be done. It is His will or our will, and God, God, my friends, accepts either choice that we, that we make. This is only the start of the Christian walk, but it begins with belief. May each of us find salvation and restoration by believing in the person and work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you do not know him today, do not delay in seeking his truth. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Fathers, we come before you this morning. We know that, Lord God, you created us for a, a, a personal relationship with you, that your desire, Lord, was to walk with us in the cool of the day. And Lord, when that was destroyed by sin, that, that you implemented another way of, of restoring that relationship and you sent your only son to this world, Lord, to die, to suffer on our behalf that we may partake, as, as David has written, in the joy of your salvation, that we may, Lord, take joy in a restored personal relationship with you by believing in the work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, I ask that you work this out in our lives, that you impress upon us that need. And, and yes, Lord, as we go forward in our Christian walk, that, that, Lord, we do so in your spirit, directed by you, and there be growth and maturity in that. But Lord, it begins with believing in who you are and the work that you have done. Father, as we have already mentioned in this service this morning, we pray for those families, friends, and others who do not know you, Lord. May they recognize the, the deep need that they have for a personal relationship with you, that it will not come in any other way, shape, or format in this world. Jesus has said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Lord God, we ask those who do not know you may impress, may you impress upon them the need for the joy of your salvation. As we do pray in Jesus' most holy name, amen.